Hello, and thank you for joining me once again for the latest installment of The Vault. My name is Julie Fry, and I'm the curator here at Stan Hewitt Hall and Garden. In May, we touched on F.A.'s departure from Goodyear. May 13th, 1921 was the last day he was officially held the title as president of that company. And at that time, I said that we would circle back and revisit the topic and get into some of that nitty gritty detail of what it was really like to leave Goodyear and all of the kind of aftermath that came during that time. We're going to do a series of episodes now to focus on that. The first one, we're going to talk kind of about blame. That's something that we hear a lot here at Stan Hewitt Hall from visitors is, well, whose fault was it? Was it FA's fault that Goodyear fell into a recession? Was it the banker's fault? Or was it some outside influence? So I don't really think there's a clear cut answer, but I'll just provide some different information uh, for each argument and everyone out there will have to decide for themselves how they feel about it. So as far as it being the banker's fault that FA had to step down from Goodyear, when Dylan Reed and Company, which was the company that was brought in to refinance Goodyear, they started their organization. It, many viewed it then as a hostile takeover because of course they were bankers, they were investors, and they saw an opportunity that here was a company that was successful but had just fallen into some financial issues. It became a hostile takeover for them. And when the company was reorganized, most of the directors were dismissed with the exception of Paul Litchfield, who at the time held the title of factory manager, and George Stottleman, who was the head of marketing and sales. Only those two gentlemen retained their positions. Almost everyone else either asked to step down or was released from their position. And all of those top Goodyear jobs were then filled with investment bankers and financers, people that had no knowledge of the rubber industry. So of course, this really helped fuel that argument for those inside Goodyear that were very supportive of FA and those outside in the community that the bankers were taking over the company and running it in a way that might not be the most uh, beneficial for Goodyear as a corporation or the greater Akron community. As far as FA and if it was his fault that Goodyear uh, fell into that recession, there's a really fantastic resource written by a man named W.D. Schiltz and it's in the collection of the University of Akron Archives. It's an unpublished history of the Goodyear Company from 1898 to 1926. And it's really a fantastic resource that I use a lot to investigate those early years of the company's history. And Schultz worked at Goodyear, so this was very much a first-hand account, but also he was very meticulous in his research and tried to be very unbiased in when he was reporting back on what happened to the company and the people that were running it in those early years. And I really think he handled the 1921 year very diplomatically. And he does point out in his book that Goodyear had no controller. Checks at that time only required one signature. Each department had its own budget process. So there was no consistency from department to department as to how you created a budget, how your budget was tracked, how you spent money. So what came with uh, the reorganization was a modern treasury department was created within Goodyear. So now two signatures were required on each check an appropriation system was established where every department's budget had to be approved and it was done with it through a consistent system. Another thing that Goodyear lacked at the time was they used local legal counsel and they had legal representatives kind of scattered all over the country. It wasn't consistent. The most of their main legal counsel were not well versed in international business laws were not well versed in large kind of corporate legal issues that Goodyear would have been, you know, needed to have information on. So with the reorganization, they created a new central legal department here in Akron and it employed lawyers that were familiar with issues common to large corporations that had an understanding of those international laws. So some of these really basic internal structures just didn't exist at Goodyear. When FA had started it in 1898, the company had grown exponentially from its founding from those early years, but the infrastructure hadn't really kept up. And the argument kind of stands to be made as even if Goodyear had weathered the recession and even if FA had stayed in place as the president, would those internal issues have caught up with him eventually? The final argument is maybe where there's some outside forces in place that made it almost impossible for FA to retain control of Goodyear. And one that's very commonly made is that the Federal Reserve, which was created in 1913, manipulated interest rates and the money supply both before and after World War I. And this really contributed to the country falling into the recession. The case could be made that if the Federal Reserve had really stopped back and was not doing that manipulation, had allowed the economy to flow naturally, possibly the recession would not have occurred post-World War I and therefore 
Goodyear would not have experienced its financial issues and FA would have kept its position. So I'll leave it up to each of you to decide which force you feel is the most compelling in the Goodyear story around 1921. Because again, as I've said, Back in the episode in May and today, it's so complicated and it could have been really all three factors contributing simultaneously to create the perfect storm that unfortunately resulted in F.A. losing his position at Goodyear. So thank you so much for joining me this week for another installment of The Vault and I look forward to talking with you again soon.